on behalf of the school, I'm pleased to welcome you to our Masters of Health Administration Administrative Grand Rounds, brought to you by the West Virginia Chapter of the American College of Healthcare Executives and the school's Health Administration Student Association. We're here today to discuss a wrap up from the West Virginia Legislative Session. I'm Sarah Woodrum, I'm the Senior Associate Dean uh, for the school and also serving as a co-interim dean at this time. As background, the West Virginia legislature meets yearly in Charleston beginning the second Wednesday in January and is in session for 60 consecutive days. The 60 day session is called the regular session. As you're all aware, the state of West Virginia wrapped up the legislative session recently and it was so full of different topics and bill numbers. And if you're anything like me, who is not intimately involved in the process, it's overwhelming to keep track of the different bills and how they affect our day-to-day -day world of healthcare, both now and in the future. So what does it all mean? Well, luckily we have some experts here today that are gonna help us understand the healthcare arena and how it changed, if any, after the 2023 legislative session. <clears throat> With us today, we have three panelists who each bring a different perspective on the legislature. I'll provide a brief introduction of each panel member, and then I'm gonna give them approximately five minutes each to give us a summary of their background and thus their perspective on what it all means. <clears throat> First on our panel, I wanna introduce <clears throat> Alexander Masia. Masia. Hopefully I got that right, Alex. You did. Who's with the West Virginia State Medical Association. Alex is an attorney at Spelman Thomas and Battle in the Charleston office, and he has his undergraduate degree from WVU and his law degree from George Washington University. His primary um, areas of practice are general litigation, administrative and government relations law, and mine safety. Alex has a great deal of experience as counsel and lead counsel in litigation surrounding many healthcare issues. Prior to working at Spillman, Mr. Masia was vice president of legal affairs for West Virginia University and chief of staff and general counsel at separate times in the governor's office. Overall, Alex has a great deal of experience working with issues affecting the state of West Virginia, such as drafting and promoting legislation and administrative rules in front of the West Virginia legislature and executive branch in areas of financial, healthcare, mining, and other industries. Welcome to our panel, Alex. Yeah, thank you very much. Second, I am pleased to introduce to you Megan Roskovensky. Ms. Roskovensky represents the West Virginia Long-Term Care Association. <clears throat> Megan was raised in Moundsville, West Virginia, and is a proud graduate of West Liberty University. While pursuing her master's degree in public administration at West Virginia University, Megan was named a Rollins Scholar by the West Virginia Le Legislature and interned in the House. Shortly after graduating with her master's degree, Megan joined the staff of the West Virginia House as a research analyst, a position she held for four years. Megan left the house in 2010 to try her hand at government relations for a local lobbying firm. In 2016, Megan joined the West Virginia Healthcare Association as the director of government relations, where she proudly advocates for our state's long-term care group. A big welcome to Megan. Our third panelist is Brandon Hatfield, who serves as general counsel and lobbyist for the West Virginia Hospital Association. Prior to joining the Hospital Association, Brandon served as committee counsel with the West Virginia House. Brandon has over 10 years of legislative experience with the last seven years specifically addressing the policies affecting healthcare. His advocacy at the state legislature has addressed a variety of issues, including modernizing the certificate of need program streamlining the involuntary hospitalization process and hospital reimbursement. <clears throat> As a native West Virginian, Brandon earned his bachelor's degree from Marshall University and his law degree from West Virginia University. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you for agreeing to serve on this panel and share your expertise. 
I'm uh, going to ask each of you, and I'll go in the same order, if you want to kind of provide five minutes about, give or take, um, from kind of your perspective of where you're coming from, and then for the format of that, for the remainder of the session, I'm going to ask some questions um, probably geared towards the specialties that each of the three of you represent, and you guys can chime in for each other's, and then hopefully we'll have time to take some questions from the audience. So, um, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah, and I appreciate this opportunity to address uh, this group here on some very important topics that uh, sometimes go under the radar because there's so much going on at the Capitol building and frankly, there really, really isn't a whole lot of really good coverage, press uh, coverage on what's going on there. And so um, our particular and respective groups have to rely upon, you know, the work that we do there that is essentially keeping monitoring everything that happens, everything that's introduced and pushed through the process. Uh, for your perspective, last session, there were 2,317 bills that were introduced of which number, 332, ultimately were enacted by the legislature. That's a 14.3% uh, rate. That is typical. So every year you're going to have an over 2,000 bills introduced and about 14 to 15% of them ultimately become law. So um, our job, and in, in, I'm, I'm sure Megan and, and Brandon can you know, elaborate on that more, is really keeping a track of all those bills that are, are introduced and how they change throughout the process here because, and, and we'll get into this perhaps a little bit later in, in terms of uh, one of our topics where um, sometimes the bills as they're introduced don't really on their surface seem to um, affect the, the things that we're interested in. And as Sarah uh, indicated, I represent, um, one of my clients is the State Medical Association. I'm very honored to uh, to lobby for them and have been doing so since 2017. Uh, my familiarity with the group started back in 2001 when on behalf of Governor Wise, when I was his general counsel, I drafted at least the introduced version of the bills that would ultimately become law, uh, creating the certificate of need service and also putting a cap on non-economic damages that can be obtained in uh, medical malpractice cases. So we were very intimately involved and worked closely with State Medical Association in those days to create Essentially, the laws that that kind of um, I I think uh, pretty much put our the entire medical and professional industry on sound footing um, at the time in the early two thousand and the uh, it was hard to obtain um, insurance coverage for medical providers in the state and as a result of our reforms we were able to bring some stability back in the system. and um, again as I said since two thousand seventeen I have been a lobbyist for them. I'm also an attorney, as you heard, um, and that's not my only, uh, State Medical is not my only client. I have, tried, I have several other clients for whom I do lobbying or am registered as a lobbyist uh, every year. And I try to keep them in, in areas that make kind of sense, um, you know, into the particular focus here. And, it's, and so I've worked uh, at times with uh, the American Heart Association, um, also with a few other groups, healthcare related groups as well and advise them, such as the American Lung Association have advised them on, on issues. Um, and even at, at one time, Nurses Association, I was following uh, particular uh, uh, legislation for them. Though my main thrust really uh, in terms of the government relations is with the State Medical Association. For those who, of you who are not uh, familiar with them, that is the organization that advocates on behalf of that, as they say, the House of Medicine at the legislature and comprises of, you know, the uh, the allopaths as well as the osteopathic uh, physicians um, and has, um, I believe last I checked was maybe two or 3,000 members uh, out of the 6,000 and some uh, physicians that are licensed in this state. And uh, we advocate and educate and certainly advocate on behalf of public health. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, and also issues pertaining to the practice of medicine itself. Thank you very much, Alex. I think that's going to be helpful for the audience to kind of know what perspective you're presenting. Um, next, uh, Megan Roskovensky, do you want to give us a little background? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my interest in, in policy and policy development actually started when I was sitting in your shoes as a student, as a, a public administration student. Um, you know, took some classes that uh, dealt with policy and and, and, and uh, policy ideas and policy drafting and, and that type of thing. And that led me to uh, an in internship with the legislature. 
uh, and then what uh, worked for the legislature full time. And um, I, I think sometimes lobbyists get a it, it kind of has a negative connotation that that you know sometimes I feel I have to feel apologetic when I when I introduce myself and say I'm a lobbyist you know I kind of feel like I have to like uh, sorry it's what I do but um, you know in in West Virginia we're a small state and we have a citizen legislature and uh, what that means is our legislative members are not full-time you know, they're here 60, 60 days for the session and then usually uh, three days a month uh, in what we call the off season. And um, I, I think lobbyists, especially healthcare lobbyists, the three of us serve a valuable role as educators. You know, Alex is right. We obviously follow, follow bills through the process and make sure that, that you know, try to prevent anything negative, uh, that would negatively impact um, healthcare in West Virginia and or try to pursue things that would positively impact. But, uh, you know, when, when you have a legislature that's made up of um, HVAC repairmen and bus drivers and contractors and businessmen and, and, and that type of thing, the role of the lobbyist really is educator. They cannot, our legislators cannot possibly know the ins and outs of the healthcare system. You guys know it's complicated and you're involved in it. We're involved in it and it can be overwhelming for us too. So to expect them to understand uh, the impacts of legislation uh, is, is really a lot to ask. So um, our role is really to, to go to legislators and say, this is what this really means. This is what this, what would really happen if the, this is in real life, this is what this looks like. Um, so I think sometimes that, that that role of ours gets lost, uh, but in West Virginia, it is, it is um, a really important, you know, and I represent that as, you know, Alex, we, we, I get to work with these guys all the time, which is great. Um, I mean, Brandon, not so much, but I like working with Alex, <laughs> but uh, we all represent providers. Um, healthcare providers, I represent long-term care. So uh, nursing homes and assisted living facilities, uh, that's that's who I go to the Capitol and try to educate. And you know, we're one of the most heavily regulated industries ever. <laughs> so even more so than hospitals and doctors. So, um, so trying to educate on all those regulations and what they, what they mean to um, our long-term care providers is a big part of what I do. Megan, I think that was really helpful. And you brought a perspective of, you know, how do you translate what happens in the legislative session to what we um, people's healthcare providers do every day? And I think that perspective is very important. So thank you for sharing it. Because I think, especially for the students on this call, it really helps educate them. Um, next, I'm going to ask Brandon Hatfield from the West Virginia Hospital Association to share a little bit about his perspective. Sure, thanks, Sarah, and thanks for having me. Uh, just to dovetail off what Megan and Alex have already talked about and a little bit on my background. Uh, so my first experience legislatively was fresh out of law school. Uh, I was hired directly uh, after graduation and I served as committee counsel to six different committees over three different legislative sessions for three different speakers under two different political parties. And that was uh, 2012 to 2015, I left there in 2015 to become general counsel with the West Virginia Hospital Association, and I'm coming up on eight years there. And so to add on a little bit of, of what Megan and Alex have talked about, I'll, I'll talk about our process at the association. So how do these issues become issues for us? And so we like to say we're a member-driven organization. And so we have a legislative committee that's comprised of uh, CEOs of our member hospitals that will bring issues to us, vet those issues. And we actually have already started preparing for the 2024 legislative session now. So we'll take a couple of weeks off, bring the group back, back together, start identifying those issues, and we vet them. And so we'll see if, is this an administrative issue that we can go to maybe the, uh, the OIC for an administrative solution, or does this problem really lend itself to draft legislation? And so once we identify those and kind of separate them out, uh, part of my role is drafting that legislation, vetting it with the members, working with committee counsel uh, at the legislature to make sure uh, we're all on the same page. And from that, after um, about eight months in October, we'll finalize that agenda and then start working on the outreach and the member education that, that Megan mentioned. 
Thank you, Brandon. Okay, so the format for the rest of the session um, is going to be, I'm gonna pose some questions and um, I'll pose it to one person, but if you wanna um, defer it to somebody else on the panel, that's fine. And if somebody else wants to chime in at the end, that's fine as well. This is a, um, a casual format. My first question is directed towards uh, Alex Masia. Um, Alex, the prior authorization bill appears to be a major win to reduce burdens on providers. Can you tell us more about how the bill came about and what role um, the hospital association and other entities and interest groups played in the process? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, this prior authorization bill, which just passed this session, uh, and for those of you who keep in score, it's Senate Bill 267. Um, actually, the it stems from uh, an effort that goes back several years. The original uh, prior authorization bill was passed in 2018, was vetoed by the governor. And you're probably asking yourself, what is prior authorization? And sadly, as for the students here, someday you'll get to learn what this is, and that's just simply the economics of providing uh, health care. Um, sometimes when, you know, in your considered opinion and judgment, a, your patient would need a particular procedure, medication, device, or something like that, you can order that. But at the end of the day, you've got payers, and those are the insurance companies. They will take a look at what you've ordered, what you and your medical judgment has decided that your patient needs, and then they'll, they're going to they're going to decide whether they're going to pay for it, or in other words, whether your patient will uh, will obtain that particular treatment or that particular device or drug that you've uh, that you have um, deemed ne medically necessary. Um, and it's a process on which there was no there were no time limits. You could submit a request, and uh, prior to the uh, passage of the law, they could just sit on it. They can sit on it for days or weeks. They would provide. They would ask for additional information, and it came. It came to be that many pra many practices in hospitals would have to devote staffs of people following up every day on the phone, on the fax machine, or whatever, providing information to the insurance company and justification for the thing that you, in your medical judgment, deemed was necessary, medically necessary for your patient. There are no rules on that. So in 2018, together, the Hospital Association, State Medical Association, and a few other uh, provider groups uh, decided, well, we need to put, we need to draw some lines on the field here, right? We need to bring this, uh, bring some order to this process and establish some time limits, which we did in 2018. And it was a bill that was, um, it was vetoed by the governor in the very last day that he had a chance to veto the bill. So in 2019, we came back with an even stronger bill and it was passed early in the session so that if there were any uh, objections to the bill uh, by the governor, that the legislature could readdress those through uh, overriding the veto. Um, and that happened in 2019, and it set some uh, initial standards. Um, it told the insurance companies that they had a certain number of days, and at the time it was seven days, by which to take a, pr to take a, uh, a prior authorization request and then return you know, something, give you a response. And if there was a disagreement, then there was a peer review process. There were different timelines for emergencies. I think it was two days in that particular bill. And that was pretty much it. So that was 2019. So you, you we go we go forward two three years. There's still some dissatisfaction in the provider community how the insurance companies were were using the prior off or authorization process. That led to some disquiet, and I think this led to um, it, it, uh, the bill that was introduced was tighten the standards even harsher. Now, back in 2019, there was what we call the gold card program, that if a provider was was conducting a certain number of procedures or receiving approval for a certain number of procedures over a period of time and was always getting approval for those, there's no reason to keep going back and getting approval. Maybe going forward a certain period of time, which is that they'd be pre-approved because of the experience in the past. Well, again, that wasn't working, and so that led to the introduction of the bill, um, the Senate Bill 267. And as as introduced, it was a little harsher. It reduced the seven days to two days, all right, and it also reduced the emergency days from two days to one day, um, and also um, it lowered the number of of uh, approved processes from 100% approval over six uh, six month period to 90%. 
So if you got 90% of a particular treatment, particular drug or device or whatever approved, then that was sufficient for another six months going forward that you didn't have to seek reapproval uh, for those. And uh, ultimately, as, as it went through the process, there was some negotiation involved and the timelines got adjusted a little seven days to two days. It's a little draconian. So it, goes, it was dropped to five days. So the companies now have five days within which to consider an approval. An important piece of this, and I can tell you as, as um, from State Medical Association perspective, is that it, it, it is now mandating all electronic access. And um, before you could always send in a fax or whatever, uh, but now this bill, uh, when it comes into effect in, on July 1st of 2024, it requires all prior authorization to be done uh, electronically through a portal that it will be established by the companies. That has given us a little bit of heartburn because some of our members are not quite invested in the electronic infrastructure. Um, but, you know, in the, the way this bill came through the process, we were told we'd have another legislative session into, you know, at least one um, before it became law to maybe look at that and see how the uh, compliance uh, with, with the conversion to all electronic uh, submissions is going with our members. Um, hospitals don't have an issue. Most of the modern uh, physician practices don't have an issue, but you're going to have some rural providers who don't have access to that or maybe are at the tail end of their their career. And they may not want to invest twenty to $30,000 or more you know, to set up that kind of a system when it just doesn't make any sense. So we're that's an issue we're going to be looking at um, later, I think, if, if it is indeed an issue for some of our members. Yeah, Alex, if I could pick up on that, one thing the hospitals are most excited about is the gold card program that Alex mentioned. And so to dive a little in the weeds on that, he mentioned, you know, the, prior to this, the goal of this was if if you're a provider and you're getting 100% approval, let's say you're you're some kind of, you're an orthopedic surgeon and you're doing shoulder scopes and 100% of those get approved, the question is, well, why do we need to keep going through the application process, possibly an appeal process, possibly a peer-to-peer -peer review? The overhead and the time involved in that was cumbersome, and not a lot of uh, the insurers were actually implementing the program. And so you heard Alex mention that the threshold was dropped to 90% approval to give a little bit of the wiggle room so you don't have to have a perfect score. But something else that, that our providers are really excited about is the previous version would only exempt you from the prior authorization requirements for that specific service. And so if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you have you hit that threshold of approval for shoulder scope, then you don't have to submit a prior authorization for that shoulder scope only. If you want to do a knee scope, that's a different procedure. You have to hit a different threshold. What we were successful in advocating for this year is if you reach that 90% threshold, the practitioner is exempt totally. And so if you're an orthopedic surgeon, all of your orthopedic practice practices are exempt now if you meet that threshold. And so it gave great, greater flexibility and less uh, administrative upkeep to keep track of each procedure, each threshold to make sure you're meeting that metrics. It's simply a, a practitioner level exemption now. So we're excited about that. Thank you both. Um, coming from the provider side myself, I can tell you <clears throat> prior authorizations and the delay and the time, and especially now with the healthcare shortage, staff shortage, this is just such a real issue that um, hospitals and healthcare organizations are facing every day. So I appreciate the insight. Very, very real issue. Um, I'm going to go to another question, and I'm going to direct this one to uh, Megan. Um, I don't want you to feel left out there. Um, Megan, will you describe the legislative landscape this session and how it may have impacted your legislative agenda? Sure. Um, so a, a couple of things were going on this session that um, actually made us kind of take a step back and say, e we're going to not be too aggressive and uh, just kind of see how the lay of the land a little bit and not have a major legislative agenda. The first one uh, kind of gets back to what I discussed in, in my introduction, and that was we had a lot of new legislators this year. We had probably, gosh, Brandon and Alex, you probably know the exact number and I don't, it, over 30 uh, yes. brand yes. new legislators this year who have never served. And um, at, in our role as educators, that's a lot of people to educate on 
um, the healthcare landscape and uh, the issues that face face healthcare providers and and that type of thing. So um, one, we knew that was a bit of an uphill battle in trying to um, really make sure that that everyone understood our perspective and where we were coming from, and uh, decided that you know we'd rather take some time. Um, introduce them to our to our industry and and educate them on on what we do. Number one, uh, the issues that we face, that type of thing, before really diving in and having a strong legislative agenda. The other thing that we saw is um, way back when, uh, way back in during the election season. Um, you guys probably remember that there were um, some um, constitutional amendments on the agenda. Uh, those caused some, some unrest, I'll say, between specifically the governor's office and the, um, the Senate leadership. Uh, Senate leadership were, were, was really very much in favor of those amendments. Governor's office was not. There was some, there was some battles that played out in the media. Uh, and um, we just saw that there was there was some tension for sure between our legislative branch and our and our executive branch, and um, some hurt feelings, to be honest. And um, we anticipated there being some some uh, just battles between the two. You know, we weren't sure that that everyone would necessarily be on the same page a whole lot because of those hurt feelings. So um, we decided to lay low and uh, um, not have not have an aggressive agenda, just because we weren't sure how how personalities were going to play out and how uh, the House and the Senate and the Senate and the in the governor's office and everybody was going to get along. So um, I think that affected our our session and and what our agenda looked like. I'm guessing it did the other two as well. But but Brandon and Alex, feel free if. Um, hospitals always have an aggressive agenda. <laughs> they never want to, they never lay low, but, um, uh, but I think the, the, the physicians did somewhat this year, um, maybe because of, for the same reasons, maybe not. Yeah, Megan, I'll pick up on that. So you're right. We did. We again had an aggressive agenda, uh, but as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, our, our legislative prep starts at the end of the previous session. And so our top legislative issue this year was uh, the PEIA program, Public Employee Insurance Agency. That was a, a three-year project that we started in 2021, incrementally uh, advocating for reforms in that program. And so our agenda was pretty much formed prior to the election. But to Megan's point, what we had to focus on as soon as the elections were over was that member outreach and education. So the first thing was just introductions. Go meet these folks in their districts bring them to the hospitals, let them meet with our administrators, and, and then share the information we have uh, for them leading into that uh, legislative session. And it's a, it's a lot of intensive uh, member education, and it was more challenging this year because of the turnover, uh, the animosity uh, between the different branches of government following the, uh, I guess, the rejection of the, the constitutional amendments. Uh, and then we were coming out of an election year. And so every every new election year, you know, we have a House of Delegates that's reelected every two years. We always have new members, so we expected some of that. But there were, as Megan mentioned, a few different variables playing in this year. But it didn't affect our um, our legislative agenda as far as substance or how aggressive it was. But it greatly affected uh, our member education and outreach efforts. And let me just tie on to that very briefly. Um, the election did did cause us to rethink our legislative agenda, frankly. Um, and we uh, went from having a few matters that we thought we would pursue to deciding to play defense and watch and wait, uh, and particularly in the in the question of immunizations. And we may have an opportunity to discuss that later today. But that was, we saw how things had developed. We, uh, uh, in the House, over 30 members were, new members came in. And imagine if, you, if your personality changed by 30% every two years. You know, you'd have to go out and re-educate people and bring them into line with the process and, and have them understand. It, it's the beauty of our system, as Megan pointed out earlier. I mean, this is a citizen legislature. You get pest, you know, pest control salesmen, cap, uh, taxi cab drivers, and people like that, and, and even lawyers who might be involved in it. And uh, But you've got the entire, it runs a gamut of the society here. And that's an important thing. It's a good thing. 
but it means that we have to do our work. Uh, it makes the work a lot harder for us to educate people. And, and that's why we, we have to start early. And we did this session and we saw the after the results that we would have a lot of work to do, particularly in the Senate, because we lost one of our longstanding stalwart uh, health care provider there in uh, Dr. Stallings or Senator Stallings who had been there since 2002 um, and fighting on behalf of physicians and also for public health in general. And even though he's a Democrat, he on those issues, he crossed the line and he formed a very valuable alliance with some of the other physicians who were in the Senate and losing him, we knew would, would cause great difficulties and we couldn't imagine how, um, you know, as the session turned out, uh, it was a major loss to us. So that, that informed us, the election results. And we decided to dig in and see and play defense on some of the issues that we knew would be coming up. Interesting landscape. Thank you. And you're right. It was a whole new group of players, or at least a big majority of it. Um, and the time it takes for them to get up to speed on things as well, and for you to kind of anticipate, know where they're coming from. Um, I'm going to move on to a third question, and I'm going to direct this one uh, to start to Brandon. Brandon, before the start of the legislative session, um, we've talked a lot about this in our classes with the students. Wheeling Hospital announced that they were not going to accept the PEIA plan effective July 1st of this year. What impact did that have on the hospital association's efforts to increase hospital rates related to PEIA? And can you help us understand how the 110% rate uh, required with the passage of Senate Bill 268 compares to what PEIA pays providers in other states? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, so as Megan mentioned with the member outreach, what that announcement did is it put at the forefront, both in the media uh, and the legislature, the PEIA crisis, which was a hospital is no longer accepting this program. Other hospitals could follow. It gave an immediacy to the issue. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's a 60 day session. That's the only opportunity we have to affect law, change law uh, during the year. And so that announcement required a solution uh, within that 60 days. But like I mentioned earlier, PEIA is something we've worked on for the last three years. And to give you a little background, it was originally designed for traditional state employees, like what you would think is a state employee. And over the years, it grew to include local cities, municipalities, some nonprofits, and it really grew beyond the scope of what the program was intended. And so in 2021, something we did was stop the expansion. And it prevented the expansion of PEIA to these municipalities and cities, because what happens is you, you take uh, a patient population from a city, let's say Charleston, who was covered under commercial insurance and move them to PEIA. That's a big loser for hospitals and all providers because of the reimbursement rate. And so in 2021, we were successful in stopping that expansion. And then last year we came in with a bill that asked for uh, hospitals to have the ability to negotiate the rates because right now PEIA sets the rate for the state and the providers have to take that. What we ask for is for this non-state entity population, this, the, the cities and municipalities, we wanted the ability to negotiate rates just for that, in that group uh, and leave the traditional state employee pool as is. Um, as Alex mentioned earlier, through the legislative session, the bill morphed. And by the end of last legislative session, so 2022, we had a bill that would allow for the 110% of Medicare rate to apply to all, um, all of PEI as opposed to just the expansion. Something that happens during the legislative session is when a bill morphs like that, uh, it's more difficult to get passed because all that member education we did before session and during session kind of goes out the window. Some of it's still relevant, but now it's a new bill. So it's a completely new topic and you're trying to, in the last 30 days, 25 days, educate everyone again, bring them up to speed on why this form of the bill works or doesn't. Uh, and so in 2022, ultimately that bill failed. And so this year uh, we came back with the 110% rate to get to that question. And so prior to this session, the rate of reimbursement, so how much a hospital gets for an inpatient from PEIA was half of Medicare. So remember Medicare reimburses below cost. PEIA was reimbursing half of that. And so what our ask was, was 110% with the goal of getting as close to break-even cost as possible for that inpatient uh, admission for a PEIA beneficiary. 
Um, last off season, I mentioned um, a lot of the, the legwork we do. And so we, we engage multiple stakeholder groups across the state. We hold public forums, uh, lots of member outreach. Uh, we do, we host uh, legislators at our hospitals and have the CEOs reaffirm and reinforce those messages. But how we arrived at the 110% was to get close to cost. And to give you a little bit of context uh, to the out-of-state reimbursement part of the question, out-of-state providers get to negotiate with PEIA. That means their rate out-of-state that they're paying for same services. These aren't specialty services. This is the same as offered in West Virginia. On average, is four to five times higher than PEIA will pay an in-state provider. No difference other than one's out-of-state, one's in-state. And so something we wanted to do also was close that gap between out-of-state and in-state. Um, what we ultimately got traction on again was what came uh, at the end of the 2022 session, which was at 110%. And again, we arrived at that trying to get as close to cost as possible. Thank you, Brandon. I think a lot of people, um, many people on this call are also uh, faculty and staff of West Virginia University and the PEIA rate increase and not only affects the employers, but is affecting the employees as well. So I think that's um, it's that's a good point you brought up that I'll touch on real quick. We, you know, we've mentioned how bills can change over a session. And so when we introduced that 110 percent rate bill. It was a standalone, we call it. And so the only issue contained in that bill was the increase for the inpatient rate. What the legislature saw was an opportunity to implement additional reforms in how they administer their employee benefit plan. And so instead of moving our bill that is solely related to that inpatient rate, moving that bill by itself and passing it, that got forwarded into a larger piece of legislation, which ultimately affected the premiums, uh, the spousal coverage, et cetera. And so that's how that's how that bill got married in. It did not start uh, this session as a um, complete reform uh, piece of legislation. It started very narrowly to affect inpatient rates, but was expanded um, probably two to three weeks in. Thank you for that clarification and um, further information. Yeah, it's had a real trickle down effect on uh, the budget for state entities plus kind of employees planning out of pocket expenses. So um, it's it's timely for sure. Um, any other comments from Meg or Alex? Okay, I'm going to move on then and uh, hit another question that I had that I thought um, our audience might be interested in. And I'm going to direct this one first to Alex. Alex, will you describe legislation that um, may have affected scope of practice in the recent session and maybe just define really quickly what I mean by scope of practice? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Yes. Um, every session we seem to face these kind of issues and it's, it's scope it's scope of practice issues as Sarah indicated and, and and it is what it seems to be it's like what is your scope of practice as a physician or what could you do and who else could do that I mean do you have to be a licensed physician for instance uh to be to uh, administer anesthesia um do you have to be an ophthalmologist in order to use lasers for instance, and those two in those two examples, I'll get to, I'll tie them back to some bills because these are recurring issues. Brandon and I are both licensed attorneys. No, no legislature is telling us whether or not only we could do simple wills or whether paralegals could also do simple wills or just any citizen might be able to do a, a, a simple will or a simple non-contested divorce. We have the monopoly on that practice uh, in our profession. Physician profession, however, does not have does not enjoy that uh, that immunity, so to speak, because you know, part of it is just the way it developed. Obviously, you're going to have extenders, you're going to have nurses, you're going to have CRNAs, you're going to have uh, physicians assistants, you're going to have all these other uh, professionals out there who could assist with uh, in medical procedures, and you know there is a place for them. There ought to be, but what has occurred. Um, in in recent years, and and it's been exacerbated actually by the uh, the uh, COVID uh, experience in 2020 um, is in 2021 is that you're going to have some specialties or some professions try to creep into the practice area. And the two that I referenced were CRNAs and anesthesiologists. Uh, the other ones optometrists and ophthalmologists. And they resulted in bills whereby um, prior uh, existing law requires that a uh, CNR, CRNA um, actually can administer anesthesia, but it has to be under the, in the presence of and under the supervision of a licensed physician. And that's existing law. 
what they have been trying to do for the past four or five years is to pull that requirement out. Of course, they'd set some minimum educational and experiential uh, standards, but they essentially create independent practice for CRNAs. Um, and they want to set that in law that going forward, the CRNAs may be able to uh, practice in cooperation with a physician, but they do not have to be under their su supervision or in the presence of, of a physician anymore. Um, that's something that uh, that uh, the anesthesiologist certainly, um, but also the State Medical Association, in addition to that, we fought that every year, um, simply because it, there there's just, um, you know, you can have, you know, as they say, a pilot can land the plane 99% of the time, but but when you've got a situation that arises, when you've got a complication, that you would need a physician actually to be able to help, um, and because of their education, their training, uh, and their experience would be the per best person to assist someone who is having uh, experiencing some side effects, uh, for which a CR CRNA is not trained and does not have the the, the hours of experience in uh, handling situations. Similarly, we have another uh, a bill that came up, and the, and the bill I just referenced for those of you keeping track at home, it's Senate Bill 52. Um, other one is House Bill 3278, and that's a battle that goes on, that's been going on between optometrists and op ophthalmologists for years, and it kind of resurfaced again, and um, there are many aspects to it, but one of the major, uh, I guess, uh, aspects is um, that uh, Optometrists are allowed to use uh, diagnostic lasers and they added therapeutic, the word therapeutic to the language. And that of course causes the big, one of the, one of the uh, uh, flashpoints there in the fight is should we allow optometrists to do that? This all arises in the context of the legislature is telling the professions what they can do. And they do that through their own respective licensing boards. If you go into that section of the code related to optometrists, there is a laundry list of things that they're allowed to do. Okay, not so much for the ophthalmologist because um, you know they they fall under the uh, Medical Practices Act, but for optometrists and also again you know for the APRNs and others who are who are, who provide uh, healthcare services, they have a, literally a list of things that they can or cannot do, and uh, you will have that battle almost every year when you've got uh, that pressure from a particular organization that wants to expand or. You know, as they see it, they can provide services that they're trained and educated to do. The other professional look at it, it's like, no, you're encroaching upon my practice and you're potentially endangering the, the health and safety of patients because you're not as trained as I am. And we've seen this with physical, uh, with uh, physical therapists, with athletic trainers and physicians and things like that over the years. This last year was the ophthalmologists and optometrists and the CRNAs and the uh, anesthesiologists. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Brandon or Meg, anything you want to add to this one? No, just to give you a little context, historically, the hospitals have uh, veered clear of scope of practice issues. Um, as Alex knows, we employ both. We have uh, registered nurse anesthetists, we have anesthesiologists, uh, et cetera. And so, yeah, we typically stay out of those fights and leave it to those respective groups. Probably smart. <laughs> um, I also, I think this is a really important issue because um, not only with staffing shortages, but in a lot of rural areas where it's hard to recruit physicians um, and other um, licensed practitioners, um, scope of practice really comes into play. And there's a lot of emphasis now in the organizations on really people working everybody to the top of their license. Mm -hmm. So scope of practice is important. Thank you though, for your perspective, Alex. Um, next, I'm going to turn this back to Megan. Um, Megan, access to care is often raised as a concern, especially in the more kind of rural areas of our state. COVID um, certainly definitely exacerbated that issue for a time, and especially relating to bed closures in hospitals. Can you uh, discuss House Bill 2758 and how it would have impacted the number of beds in nursing homes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as as Alex talks about playing defense, this was a big bill that we played defense on, uh, and and uh, luck, we're we're uh, luckily able to uh, prevent its passage. So um, this bill, we lovingly refer to it as the bed bill. Uh, it would have required all nursing homes to limit 
the number of beds in their rooms to two. So um, there could have been two resident or one resident beds per room, no more, which sound, it, the vast majority of our nursing homes already, already abide by, uh, by that. They already have two or one beds. And frankly, if it were me, I wouldn't want any more than two people in a room with me either. I barely want to share a bedroom with my husband. Um, so it sounds great. It sounds great. <laughs> they both know my husband. They get it. <laughs> yeah, it, we know Charlie, so understand. <laughs> um, but um, there are some some nursing homes that were built specifically to you know, with, with multi-bed units. Um, they're not a traditional bedroom uh, that would, or, you know, that would, that would host, ha have two beds in them. They're, they're units that would um, house three or four residents in that unit. Um, and they were just built that way. Not, you know, they have some nursing homes were built with um, two four bed units. With, while the rest of the rooms have have the more traditional what you would think of in a one or two bed uh, setup, and it's only a handful of of um, of nursing homes that are left with these larger units, but they're in more rural areas, and um, a lot of these facilities that are left with these larger units don't have either financially don't have the, the opportunity to expand or physically don't own the property to expand their facilities and renovate their facilities to get rid of these larger units. Um, and what we found is with this, if this legislation were to have passed, um, there are facilities in the state that would have had to kick out, um, you know, the, if we had to say we went to, to two beds, uh, the two bed requirement, those additional beds in those larger units would just have been eliminated. So some of these facilities would have had to just flat out eliminate five or six beds. And uh, in a more rural community where, where there aren't close by nurse, other nursing homes, other options, eliminating five or six beds is a really big deal. And we would literally have had to um, kick out residents in order to um, to abide by that two bed limit. And honestly, it is absolutely a goal. And and the vast majority of our nursing homes absolutely are, are don't don't have more than more than two residents per room. But for those few communities where, that do, it would have been a really big deal and a real access to care issue uh, for those nursing homes. And, and access to care is, is a, you know, that's just one example. It is a much bigger topic for all of our, all of our providers that we represent. Um, the shortage, the, the staffing shortage, uh, you know, if it hasn't already created access issues, it, it will if, thing, if things don't improve. Uh, we're we're experiencing um, that from the federal level, some federal regulations that are going to come uh, that look like they're going to come down the the pike for nursing homes are are going to create real access issues in our state, and it's I know it's a concern for for everyone on the panel, and and um, probably you know we're we're hopeful that that a lot of your students are are going to uh, help you know, come, come and work for us, come and work for nursing homes and hospitals and, and, uh, and physicians and, and we'll help address the, those access issues. Well, thank you, uh, Megan, for stating that at the end. That's a very good point. We have several of our MHA students that are interning um, in long-term care facilities. So this is um, interesting. Um, Brandon or Alex, do either of you want to comment on this? Just briefly, yeah, you know, the, the staffing challenges that Megan mentioned are affecting us too. When, when we talk about hospital capacity and hospitals operating at capacity, what we mean is capacity to staff the beds. Uh, we actually physically have more beds. I think rough estimate, we're probably operating about 70% of the beds we have available in the state with the other 30% unavailable to be staffed. And so the staffing shortage has hit us really hard. We've seen a lot of uh, folks leave the nursing profession or leave the medical profession following COVID. 
And so the, the supply just isn't uh, isn't meeting the retirements and the folks who are leaving the profession altogether. Great. I just wanted to um, also announce to everyone listening that if you have a question, just put it in the Q and A. Um, Kara Forrest, who's here with us helping uh, with the panel, is moderating the Q and A. I will just continue to ask questions, though, if nobody puts one in. So, but we are checking that. Um, I'm going to move ahead to another topic that I think is very important. We uh, discuss in our classes um, certificate of need, and obviously that's a state by state, but in West Virginia, we are a certificate of need state. So Brandon, um, how do you think the recent legislative session affects the certificate of need process in our state, if any? Yeah, so the, the, I think it's Senate, it's Senate Bill 613, I think it greatly affects it. So if everyone's got kind of the base level knowledge of CON, I won't go into the details of what it is, but what this bill does is it exempts hospitals from all certificate of need requirements on their campus, meaning uh, if they want to start, if a hospital wants to start an open, uh, open heart surgery uh, department, they can do that without a certificate of need. They can offer any services that are reviewable so long as it's on that campus. And so the impact that's having uh, if you if you go through and look at the certificate of need applications that have been withdrawn, um, I think you can see the impact there is several projects that, that folks had applied to the healthcare authority for permission to develop services. Those applications have since been withdrawn because it's now a completely exempted activity. Uh, so it's allowed for greater flexibility uh, for hospitals. It does keep all other providers uh, under their certificate of need program. But as far as uh, it relates to hospitals, it's going to allow for uh, substantially more flexibility in how they develop and, and health plan. Do you think it decreases um, sort of the preferential treatment that was felt um, for, I think, bigger healthcare organizations in the state? I mean, do you think it? You mean uh, as far as approvals or denials go? Mm -hmm. So I, I know that was a sentiment probably prior, um, at least for my end, prior to 2016-ish. Uh, so we, we, did, we did two rewrites. We had a, a substantial rewrite in 2016, and I think what we called cleanup in 2018. Uh, the, the reports come back that the majority of CON applications are approved. Uh, what we found and kind of drawn from that data is that there are so many uh, consultants, attorneys, um, other advocacy groups, interest groups involved that advise their clients prior to applying for these services, the likelihood of success. And so I think the reason you see such a high approval rating is that consultants and attorneys are doing their jobs and advising their clients that look based on precedent, this will or won't get approved. Uh, and so folks simply didn't apply for something that they were advised they would not get approved for because of the cost involved. Great, yeah, that, that helps. Um, Alex, anything you wanted to add to that? No, okay. Um, we're coming down on the hour. I knew it was going to fly by, but never did I think it was going to go this fast. So I want to give one more topic out there at least. Um, and I'm going to direct this one at Alex. Alex, throughout session, there was extensive talk and discussion about changing the West Virginia school vaccine requirements. Um, can you just review where these efforts ended and what role um, maybe the different associations played in the process? Yeah, thank you. And, um, and this is a, a particular issue of concern for us. Our president actually is Dr. Lisa Costello, who is a pediatrician, I think an assistant professor at WVU. And in previous years, before she uh, as ascended to the presidency, she led our defensive efforts against the uh, any changes to the uh, state immunization laws. And I uh, caution, we like to use the word immunization, not vaccination, because vaccination seems to be tied to COVID. And we found that we have a very negative reaction when we talk about vaccines because it ties in. People are people get confused. Some of the legislators got confused and thought, well, maybe maybe we're trying to mandate COVID or not. States uh, compulsory immunization laws uh, actually relate to only, I think, 10 diseases and they're set forth in code. I am happy to report that this year they failed. They failed to change those. They failed to relax them. Although they came very, very close, and we spent, I spent most of the session, I know Dr. Costello did, uh, working, you know, with members, coming to Charleston, um, and also conducting a media campaign to defeat the effort. There are 23 bills that were introduced this last session that in some way or another impacted the immunization laws. Some of them were pretty direct. They said they repealed it. <laughs> they, they repealed the office of the state immunization uh, officer. 
Um, and some of them said you can have, you know, any personal or religious exemption. Others were not quite as direct. And, you know, you have a bill like Senate Bill 645, which says that uh, there's that you may not be forced to take any medical. Uh, this is this is from coming directly from from the language of the bill. You may not be compelled or coerced to take any medical product or or to be deprived of benefit from taking a medical product. And there's another bill about parental rights, you know, and that parental rights bill, which, you know, it, it seems innocuous that parents have full autonomy and authority over their children. No other law may contravene that. So you have those laws that we have to keep an eye on because, yes, they, they do not directly uh, affect the immunization laws, but by the strict application of the language, yes, they do because you've given the parents the full autonomy. You've, done, you've said that you cannot be, you've uh, enacted a law that says you cannot be forced to take a medical product or be derived of benefit deprived of a benefit because you refuse to. Um, and we, again, we spent the entire session fighting these. Uh, we do have very strong immunization laws in the state. That's why you never see or hear of a measles outbreak here like you would elsewhere. In previous sessions, we could almost always count on California to have, or Ohio to have a measles, major measles outbreak during the session, which kind of helped guide our story. Um, didn't quite have a big enough one in Ohio this year, but um, the fight in in the in the house is it was lost and has been lost in many years. And so our bulwark against any uh, changes to the law really was in the Senate. And the Senate this year was very close. We got it down to where it would have been a tie vote if it had come up in committee. And so for that reason, it never never came up in committee, although it was it was very close. Um, we expect the battle to continue next year. They may chip away at it. They say, they may uh, try to say, well, we'll just apply it to public schools, well, private schools. I don't know that uh, any of those diseases know the distinction between the public and private educational institutions. Uh, measles, you can get anywhere. Um, but um, they, they will come back again next year. And that's, we know already the next year we'll have a major fight in, on our hands. But so far, we've been able to hold the line. And we've helped with, helped with you know, from you know various groups, you know, obviously, it played a played a major role in that in the hospital association, also, you know, the state healthcare association as well, um, because it impacts everyone. You know, a child coming home with the measles will get their grandparents ill, and we have a lot of grandparents who are raising children in the state. So, um, very important issue. And you bring up a really good point about vaccine versus immunization, and sort of the fear that's provoked uh, from a COVID perspective, but also for school-aged children and parental rights. So it's, it's, it's complicated when you peel back the layers of the onion. Mm -hmm. um, Brandon, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, just uh, Dr. Costello was a rock star this past legislative session. Yeah, um, her, there were two different uh, pediatric groups uh, working with Alex and his group. Uh, we supported their efforts. We weren't out in the front. Uh, it, was, it was mainly Alex and his, and his teams. Our concern, uh, aside, in addition to the public health risk, is back to the capacity. Um, like I said, we can't staff all the beds we have. And so in Alex's example, a kid goes home and gets grandma and grandpa sick with measles, and there's an outbreak in a small community. Well, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the hospital. And if, if there's not enough staff and not enough staff beds to care, then we can't handle the outbreak. And so that was some of our concern is, if an outbreak were to occur, do we have the capacity to treat it or contain it? And I think, Brandon, you just wrapped up every single issue we talked about all in like one sentence because it all really, it all really does overlap. Um, I am going to wrap up the legislative session now because I want to be respectful of, of people's time. I do want to um, give a special shout out to Jim Kaufman, who is the president of the West Virginia Hospital Association for his support and background information for making these administrative grand rounds happen today. And the fact that he coerced, I mean, asked each of you nicely <laughs> to participate on our panel. So a thank you to Jim. On behalf of the Public Health School um, and the uh, West Virginia chapter of the American College of Healthcare Executives and the School of Public Health Health Administration Student Association, I just want to thank each of you for participating in this uh, legislative wrap up. Thank and um, yeah, I look forward to seeing all the exciting work that happens in the years to come. And thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you for the invitation. Appreciate thank it very much. much. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. See ya.